Hi there, Heike Yates here, and welcome back to another episode of the Pursue Your Spark podcast. Have you ever felt super excited about something in your life and you didn't know what to do with all the excitement? You're trying to figure out where to start and how to set or manage priorities to reach that goal that you are so excited about. I sure have been there and I can imagine you have been there too and it would definitely help if you had a plan of action that you could follow. Our guest today knows a thing or two about managing preferences, as you'll find out. The love of football and her country led to a career as a fighter pilot. Her dad, a football coach of 42 years, taught her skills of practice, hard work, discipline, and teamwork to succeed. She says life itself is the ultimate challenge. But what matters is how we choose to face its opportunities, obstacles, victories, and defeats. I'll see you in a minute. Hi there, you're listening to the Pursue Your Spark podcast. I'm your host and fitness warrior, Heike Yates. And on this show, we empower women over 50 to take back their health and strength with sound fitness, nutrition, and mindset strategies. Our guests on the show share their honest stories so that you'll have the courage to take action, knowing that you're not alone in your struggles. Today's guest is Kate Jigga Lowe. She's a fighter pilot, mom, and instructor who attacks everyday life with fighter pilot tactics embracing life with enthusiasm and being proactive. For Jiga, that's everything from parenting her two girls to supervising 100 aircrafts. Jiga believes that life itself is the ultimate challenge. But what matters most is how to choose to face its opportunities, obstacles, victories, and defeats. Welcome to the show, Jiga. Hi, Heike. It's great to be here. So, of course, I want to know... What is Jiga? Where did Jiga come from? <laughs> That's a great question. I get that a lot, actually. So when you put it, Kate Jiga Low, it sounds like Jiga Low. It actually doesn't even have a story behind it. It just, after a couple of beers, it sounded super funny. And um, it's kind of been my alter ego ever since. <laughs> That's a good, a good as any reason. <laughs> yes, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's not even how you spell Jigga, but that's okay. That's okay. That that's all good. So it's like, yep, it just stuck with it, you know. Yes. yes. No, Jigga, what were you like as a kid? Tell our audience what were you like as a kid. Now that you're a fighter pilot, and we're getting into your story today. <laughs> so, what were you like as a kid? That's so funny um, because, of course, I'm home right now with my girls who are eight and thirteen, and I was very much like my thirteen year old. And um, this is what my mother calls payback. But she, you know, very, very talkative, very inquisitive, very enthusiastic, just into everything. And so that included everything from playing with my brother and my sister to, you know, cooking with my mom to watching way too much football with my dad since he's a football coach. And so, um, you know, I, I grew up in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. It's nowhere near an Air Force base, uh, just lovely suburbs. And it was a great place to grow up. And I just thought I could do everything because no one ever told me that I couldn't. That's a good reason. <laughs> like, no restrictions. I love it. So you grew up in, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I and did. So tell us about your family and your brothers and sisters and what, what was life like back then? Absolutely. I am totally a kid of the 80s and everything that goes with that, station wagons and minivans and, you know, not seatbelts till we were 10. Um, so yeah, um, Lancaster is right in the heart of Pennsylvania, um, really Amish country for anybody that is familiar with that. Witness, the movie was filmed in the 80s, very close to my parents' house. Um, they moved in right before I started kindergarten and they still live in the same house today. So um, my mom was a part-time dental hygienist. So um, whenever I meet people, either she cleaned 
your teeth or my dad coached your kids in football. So, um, <laughs> but uh, my sister's three years younger than me and my brother is uh, three years younger than her. So, you know, lots of time running around the backyard, um, dirty feet and catching lightning bugs and going to football games. Um, my mom uh, has a lot of brothers and sisters. My dad has two brothers. So big family gatherings and just, it was really, it was really idyllic, like looking back on it, just um, very supportive and um, fun and just everything that I think looking back on it, I wanted my childhood to be. That sounds really wonderful. That's funny. We were a small family, but I grew up in the country as well. And I would like run around with the farmers. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yes. So it was like this freedom that you described. It's like, you, you know, you just go wherever you went. And at night you just came home to shower and take a bath and eat dinner. That's right. Dirty and happy. Yes. <laughs> now, are you still living in Lancaster? No. So um, I left for college and went to Notre Dame, which is in Indiana. And I really haven't been back except for those summers since. Um, the Air Force has taken me all over the country, um, never outside the country to live. And, um, you know, we've, we've lived in countless states at this point. And it's awesome to go back and visit. My kids think it's the greatest place in the world. Um, they actually told me they wish they were quarantined in Lancaster. Um, just because it's a fun place to visit and it's always fun to go back. My best friend um, still lives there and it's a great place to go back and visit. And it's, it's very, I found it very grounding over the years that, you know, that has always been my home. So no matter where I've lived or how long I've been gone or how many kids I've had or where my husband's been stationed, it's always been really nice to go back to Lancaster and know that it's, that it's there. It's there, yeah. So how did you get into being a pilot, I mean, that's not just uh, an average job <laughs> that you pick and you go like, oh yeah, I'm gonna be an accountant. Right, right, so I'm sure there are plenty of us that are about my age who, you know, in 1986 saw Top Gun and thought, that is really cool. Um, so that was kind of, as, <laughs> as, yeah, as lame as that sounds, it was, it was kind of a nice little catalyst. I always knew I wanted to go in the military. I looked at the Naval Academy because it was close, we visited. But um, my dad is a retired uh, guidance counselor. And so he came home one day when I was in high school and said, hey, do you know about ROTC, the Reserve Officer Training Corps? And he said, basically, you can go to a quote unquote regular college and still earn your commission. And I was like, yes, that is what I want to do because I want to go to college and figure out, you know, how late can I stay up before an exam and set my own schedule and do all those things. But I also really wanted to keep that military piece so it wasn't until I actually got to college that I really started exploring flying and just, I thought it would be the hardest and coolest thing I could do. And so that, <laughs> there I was. What does it mean to earn your commission? Right. So there are three different ways you can earn a commission. Um, so you can either do an academy, like the Air Force Academy, for example, and then at, in those four years, you earn your college degree and you... Um, earn your commission as a second lieutenant in the Air Force. So that's one route. And then you can also do OTS where basically you, you've you already got your college degree and you go to training for several months. And when you graduate from that, you're a second lieutenant. And then the third way is ROTC where basically you go to college um, and while you're there, some of your classes include ROTC. And so you learn very basic things like how to march and how, you know the rank system and all those things. Um, there's some physical fitness involved. There is field training involved where you actually go to an encampment. And so it's kind of, it's to, say, to say you earned your commission, it's very similar to say you, know, you earned your degree. Because um, I remember being about halfway through and somebody saying like, oh, this is what it means to earn it. This is, this is hard. Um, but it was the perfect combination for me. I was super involved in ROTC, um, pretty much did everything I could in it, took every opportunity I could, um, but really still relished being in a civilian uh, academic environment. So to me, it was the best of both worlds and the absolute right choice. Yeah, and at this point, you were not flying any aircrafts already, right? No, no aircrafts. And that's you know, kind of an important distinction. And I always try to tell people that when they ask me about flying and they ask me about, you know, joining Air Force, um, really, 
as far as commissioning goes, the Air Force is in the business of making officers. And then the career field part comes after that. So unless you are going to a very specific guard unit that you get hired by, let's say, for example, the DC Guard, they fly F-16s. They're going to hire you to specifically go to pilot training to fly F-16s. That is more the exception than the rule. Usually most of the commissioning sources are, we're basically training you to be an officer. And, you know, the colonel that was at Notre Dame when I was commissioned was this old crusty F-111 pilot, and he was awesome. And he had just come from this big um, operation group. And he would wear his flight suit on Fridays, and he would just, you know, tell me, I'll just throw some jet fuel on me. I just, I miss it. And But even he would really emphasize that, you know, we are here to make officers and the rest of it comes after. And I will say, um, part of the reason I, I emphasize that to people is you just never know what's going to happen. Um, there's a lot of medical requirements to fly. And I think to see people, not that flying is not a wonderful dream, but if that's, if that's the thing you're hanging your hat on and, you know, you blow out your knee playing flag football your junior year and you're unable to fly or there's something weird, you know, some very random heart condition they find in like the final testing um, before you go to pilot training, you don't want that to be, it's obviously devastating, but y- you want to have a path of that you, you actually chose in this case, the Air Force um, and that the flying was not secondary, but, but a bonus, if you will. And so um, I was trying to encourage people that to make sure that they, they really think through that, you know, that, that they want to at least do the four years in the Air Force to pay back their commitment for the training, and then they can always go on to do it, um, something else. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's like a two-path, actually, to say, okay, there is an option there, but you can make a career in the one direction. Yes. And that can be your career. It doesn't have to be that you become a, a, pilot, a fighter, fighter pilot. That's right, that's right. Yeah. So, but we, we want to know how you became a fighter pilot. I mean, you went to <laughs> training, you did all this, and then you're like, yeah, I'm going to go and do this. What happened? Right. So I, they basically ask you uh, in like, your third year, who wants to apply to pilot training? And I was like, ooh, ooh, I do. And so put in all the paperwork to go to pilot training. And then once uh, I was accepted, they came back and said, does anybody want to go to this cool base where um, they do Euro NATO uh, joint jet pilot training, which is at Shepard Air Force Base. So okay. of course I said, sure, that also sounds cool and hard. So I applied for that. Um, traditionally, Notre Dame would get one um, pilot training graduate to, to go to that base. And so I got to go. The very cool thing about, well, there's lots of cool things about Shepard. Um, one of them being that when I was there, all the Americans that graduated in the program got fighters. So that was great in that we weren't competing against each other for helicopters and you know, tankers and heavy aircraft, everybody was going to get a fighter. So that was very cool. And that's a huge draw. And it definitely gives it a different vibe because pretty much everybody there, at least in the second half of your training, they're all fighter pilots. So it gives it a different, a different vibe. The other thing that was very cool. Um, and my favorite part really was that it was a Euro NATO program. And so in my class, um, while the majority were Americans, it also was very well representative from a lot of other countries. And if there was a student in my class that was from that country, then we would also have to have instructors in our flights that were also there. For example, I had three classmates who were Turkish. And so we always had a Turkish IP in our flight, um, especially when things would get very complicated and it would be a lot easier for them to speak in their native language. Mm-hmm. So it was great. The, when I was there, the only two countries that had students in every class uh, was the U.S. and Germany. So I had uh, four German classmates, and then um, I also had the Netherlands, um, Italy, Norway, and I think that's it. And I already mentioned Turkey. So it was it was really excellent um, experience. It's been fun to, you know even when we've lost touch to see each other in other places. Um, But yeah, it was, it was great. And the other thing I will say is that um, I really think American fighter pilots are excellent um, at debriefing. We're very hard on ourselves. 
but sometimes we can get a little uptight and up and in our heads. And so in a very competitive and in a very stressful atmosphere that pilot training just is mm -hmm. necessarily, it was really nice, um, you know, to have the occasional, you know, Danish IP that would just be like, Hey, it was a bad ride. What are you going to do? Just learn something and move on. So it took a little bit of uh, pressure off. And also we weren't only, we were only competing against our own country, right? So I was not competing as anybody from any other country to get to my F-16. So anyway, basically at the end of pilot training, they come down, the Air Force says, here are the planes that we have, and we're going to match you guys up to that. And so um, I really, really, really wanted an A-10, and my class didn't get a single one. And so the class after me got eight, so ironically. But um, it was really cool. Um, most of my class got F-16s, the Americans, and the very cool thing was a lot of our, you know, international friends also flew F-16s. So, um, you know, a lot of us were going to the same airframe. Jacob, what is the difference between all the A-16 and the F-14 and the whatever else there was? Sure, the sure. Were not sure. pilots. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, the F is for fighter, the A is for attack. Um, and I would say the easiest way to remember F-16 is what I tell people is it is one seat, one person, one pilot. It is one tail when you're looking at it, and it's one engine. So um, the F-16 is multi-role, so it does air-to-air -air in that it carries missiles, and it can shoot other aircraft, and it does air-to-ground, so it also carries bombs, so it can drop uh, bombs. And um, that it's kind of a jack-of-all-trades as an airplane. Um, so yeah, it's, that's the most, that's the simplest explanation, um, just to kind of get a feel for, for what the F-16 does. So when you go to F-16 training and, and most, most flying training, you learn how to fly the airplane first, you know, take off, land, a lot of emergencies. Um, the F-16 only has one engine. So we spent a lot of time talking about, Hey, you don't have an engine. Now you're a $25 million glider. Um, <laughs> yeah, and then and then we move on to stuff. You know, first we usually do air to air, where we fight in the air against other airplanes. First one, and then multiple, and then we move on to um, the air to ground, the the bombing part part of it, which is always the part I've found the most interesting. Mm -hmm. So the passing the test sounds really challenging. Yes. So I will say that um, I showed up at pilot training with almost no experience. I had only a couple hours flying as a civilian and the the introduction to flying training was shut down be, uh, for about six months for me leading up to pilot training so I had almost no experience um, the Europeans were very experienced because they only sent their best and brightest to the states so for example my Dutch counterparts already had at least 60 hours of military flying time oh, wow. and, yes so um, I was definitely disadvantaged. And then the other Americans were coming from, you know, it was the captain of the flying team from the Air Force Academy. And one guy was an instructor pilot for gliders at the Academy. And one guy who was in the guard actually worked for the company, like Cessna, the actual company. And so I walked in there and I was like, oh, this is, this is going to be rough. So it was quite an adjustment for me to understand military flying and military flying training. So the first six months in T-37s were a huge struggle and I grew thick skin pretty quickly. And then by T-38s, the second half, um, that was a much better equalizer. And I, I definitely, I will fully admit was, was a late bloomer as a pilot because it just wasn't anything I had very much experience with. I'm not the most natural of pilots as far as hands. Like some people, just are very naturally gifted that way. For me, it's always been much more structured and procedural. Mm -hmm. And so I had to kind of learn how to think that way. And, you know, once you spent that much time learning to think that way, it sticks with you forever. Mm -hmm. Now, when we're talking about thick skin, I'm, <laughs> imagining, I'm imagining there's a lot of guys and very few women. How is that going? It's like, how many women were in your class, women were in your class and, and how did, you know, the thick skin business? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there was one other girl in my class. She was Dutch, but we were in separate flights. So I didn't see her as much. And then about 
halfway through my time there, there was one female instructor. She wasn't my designated instructor, but um, yes, Shepard, because it was primarily fighters, um, and this was late nine, the late nineties, we didn't, not enough women had gone and flown with fighters and come back to teach. So um, yeah, it was definitely different. I will say that I have been extra, extraordinarily lucky. I have had very supportive class, male classmates um, in pretty much all of my classes. Now that being said, um, in general, fighter pilots are pretty tough on each other, very sarcastic. Um, but from my standpoint, it was very fair in that we were all very hard on each other and joked around a lot and, you know, could really give each other a hard time. But it was, I never had more of it than anybody else did. That was just how we interacted. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the thick skin professionally, that was really the hard part for me. Like my dad's a football coach. I grew up hearing plenty of rough language and, and all that. I joke around with my uncles all the time. Um, so that part of it socially was fine. Professionally, it took a little bit to get used to because um, I think what um, makes fighter pilots a little bit unique, um, especially Western trained fighter pilots, is that um, we're extremely difficult on each other in the debrief. And it's this huge process of, you know, you take off your rank and you sit there and you're really very honest about the mistakes that were made and then what you can do to fix it next time. And then when it's over, you have to walk away from it and move on and not take it personally. And so that took a little bit of getting used to, but now I, I'm a huge debrief junkie. I think it's one of the most important things that we do, but professionally, especially because I was struggling at first, it took some time to kind of get used to the fact that that's just how I was going to hear it, you know, no sugar coating and just um, try to learn what I could and move on. Yeah. Men tend to be very straightforward with us. They don't, attach for, for the men that I did come across in my career along the way. They're just like, well, that's just how it is. And no emotions attached to it. Where women tend to be more emotional about this whole thing and break out well, in tears or take it personal or want to run away. And, you know. <laughs> well, it's funny because I actually, you know, many of my friends and, and my family are, are teachers and they, they work in a career field that's, there are many more, women and now it's been so long that I I'm not sure that I can handle that because I've just become so accustomed to working with men and I really do appreciate that there is um to say that they have short memories and I mean that in the best possible way in that like you sit down you talk about what went wrong and then you walk away and go have a beer and they're better in general, I find at letting things go. And mm -hmm. so I, I like that part of working with men. It's, they don't hold grudges and I'm obviously overgeneralizing, but in general, it is, it is nice to just, Hey, let's just get it out and talk about what needs to be talked about. And then let's go move on. And it's not personal. And you know, I, I'm not going to hold a grudge and it's just, this is, this is how it is. And we'll, and we'll go on from there. It doesn't, I don't find that to be um, uncaring. Like I have had nothing but very supportive and um, caring and, almost, and, and sometimes, you know, like loving friendships with people. Um, but, you know, fighter pilots are known for being world-class compartmentalizers. And so that's just, that's just kind of how we're wired. Yeah. You created a group of um, women getting together from your uh, squadron. Is that the right word? Uh, it was the whole base, yeah. So there was, the I, base. yeah, there weren't enough of us in the squadron to have a group, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so how did that mature? How did that start, and what was it all about? Well, originally, um, it was just two of us on base, and we ended up in the same squadron and in the same office, even, which was hilarious. Um, and eventually, uh, we got up to about five female instructor pilots, and we were like, you know we never had this many of us together. We should go grab lunch. And then it was, Hey, we should go have dinner. And so it just was a nice way. We were all spread out over base. And so it was a nice way to get to know each other. Um, when I left that base and went to my next base, I kind of put some feelers out to try to meet some other women that were again, dispersed at that base. And same thing, it was just, even if it was just once a month, like let's grab dinner. And 
uh, you know, it's gone through different iterations. It started off um, CFPA, the Chick Fighter Pilot Association. Mm -hmm. um, there's, you know, I'm not a big social media person, but they have Facebook. Uh, they have a Facebook page now. Um, you know, the term fighter pilot also includes like um, our our weapon system officers that uh, also fly in the F-15E. And so it's just become this this nice community of supportive women. Um, Athena's Voice, um, our speaking group, is somewhat of an offshoot of that. And it's just nice to, you know, exchange ideas and hang out. Um, I The reserve job I work at now, I see a lot of, like, young captains come through, and it's nice to sit down and talk to them and, you know, talk about, you know, mutual friends, all these normal things that you would – that she would do, but um, it, it, especially when it gets into um, you know marriage and children and that kind of thing, there are obviously some unique um, issues that come up with flying, and that it's nice to have that mutual support that that every fighter pilot wants. So, yeah, we had a uh, past guest that you know very well, Shock, also on the show. Yes, she was telling us a little bit more about those personal female issues. <laughs> <laughs> so funny she's so funny and i was like what well, really you never thought about this that you're in a, in a jet and you can't pee all right yes That's yes what you're gonna do <laughs> this is true this is this is totally true yes <laughs> so but i want to know from you about some of the things that you were dealing with while you were a pilot a fighter pilot that things that you can talk about i know that many things are classified but give us one scenario of something that people can get a feel that my listeners can get a feel of what it's like to go out on a mission or to go out on a, a mission. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, I think just the physicality of it in that um, you, you feel everything. So my favorite thing to do was to fly low and fast so the F-16, um, when we do low altitude, is about 500 feet off the ground at 500 knots. So if you want to estimate that at like 500 miles an hour, you can. And it is such a cool thing because when you fly very high, like if anybody's been on an airliner, like, hey, we're now at 30,000 feet and 400 yep. knots, you, you, you can't tell, right? Like it's, it's hard to tell. You don't have anything relative. But when you're that low and that fast – you really have perspective of how fast the ground is rushing by you. Um, hey, I can see trees. I can see cows. I, you know, and so you get that, that ground rush essentially. So you can, you can tell from your perspective how fast you are actually moving. Um, and so that is my favorite thing. The other thing is that the air is thicker down low, if you will. And so when you, you know, throw the airplane into afterburner, it does, it, it accelerates to the point where it will throw, you know, it throws you back a little bit in your seat. And when you pull it out of afterburner, like it, you know, it's, it's like slamming your foot on the brake in a car and you kind of get pulled forward. So those like actual pure physical sensations, I don't know if Shark talked about pulling G's, um, but you know, they show those funny videos of people in the centrifuge um, that is for real. So the F-16 is capable of nine Gs, which means that your body feels nine times the normal weight of gravity. So if you imagine how giant and heavy your head feels on your tiny little neck when it weighs, when it weighs nine times that much. And so just the, um, that physical part of it, um, we, we wear, um, obviously life support gear to protect ourselves and we strain against basically the when you pull g's right it pulls everything down so the blood is trying to pull down to your feet and your brain really would like to keep it up in your brain so you can stay conscious so um you know pulling g's like that you it breaks tiny little blood vessels so any little weak blood vessels we used to call them jesels and so you could look at like usually like on your forearm the inside of your forearm there'd be like tiny it would really look like the measles but it was just all your weakest tiny little blood vessels had popped um it's not the healthiest thing probably, but oh, it, that's kind of creepy. After this. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, you know, I, I try to, um, for my non-flying friends when, you know, they reference Top Gun and, and things like that, I try to tell them that there is a very physical aspect to flying fighters. It is physically demanding. Um, thankfully, you know, over the years we've gotten a lot better with, you know, nutrition and, 
um, exercise and, and that kind of thing. You know, I don't, you know, when I was in pilot training, like half my IPs would go out and smoke cigarettes when they, you know, in between their flights. And we don't see that nearly as much, hardly any ever now, but there's just a, um, you know, it's, there's a, it can be grueling and there's definitely a physical part to it. Like even shock talks about, you know, you have to pee in the jet, you know, you also, you're sitting there, uh, our seat is reclined 30 degrees, but you know, you're all those times that my Apple watch goes off and says, you should stand now. Well, you're, you're probably sitting in an airplane for at least, you know, two, two and a half hours at a minimum. Um, so there's, that is the part when I think about it, that, that I really, um, remember and holds the most vivid memories is the the physical part of it and the physical um, that go that goes with it. Of course, all all of the mental um, aspects as well. And that's why I, I don't fly um, like for fun because to me, flying was always my job, yeah. and I took it very seriously, uh, and as everyone does. And so I would you know kind of throw that switch and compartmentalize it. And so to me to get an airplane and go fly around on a Sunday afternoon doesn't sound relaxing. It sounds like I would need a huge amount of vigilance. So yeah. <laughs> that's, that's interesting. Yeah. I was like, after I interviewed Chuck, it's like, and now I get to interview you. It's like, and somehow it's like, you know, my, my hair in the back of my arm stands up, but for excitement, I'm like, Oh, this, I, I can't just I know really like what, what I envisioned it would be like to fly a jet. So this, this is really, I think it's really cool. And I, I'm <laughs> sure my listeners appreciate because we have some cool stories to share here on the podcast. <laughs> but something happened. You got married. I did get married. And life changed. What happened? Where did this guy come from? Oh, that's so funny. Uh, we met actually at field training, ROTC field training. He was going to Virginia Tech, and I was at Notre Dame, but we were both at ROTC. So uh, we met there, but then um, didn't see each other until we both ended up at the same base um, as brand new lieutenants. So we started dating there, uh, but he stayed in North Carolina at his assignment while I went to Texas for pilot training. I went to Arizona for F-16 school, and then we got married and ended up um, in Utah for our first assignment together. So when we started dating, I already had my pilot training slot. So it wasn't really um, a couple's conversation. Like we started dating and we were at the same base for a few months. And then I was like, see ya, <laughs> I, have to, I have to go to pilot training. But um, navigating the long distance and um, a dual military spouse um, since then has definitely, you know, had its um, ups and downs for sure. Yeah, what are some of the problems that come up between the two of you? Between the two of us or between us and the Air Force? <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's start between the two of you. <laughs> uh, no, you know what? It's, it really has never been much of an issue for the two of us um, in that we have both mutually agreed that you know, being together is the most important thing. It's a little easier when you're younger because there are more places, bases that you can go to. Um, and we were very lucky because we had compatible career fields. So he's a maintenance officer. So I fly him, he fixes them or his troops, his troops fix them. So that allowed us to align a little bit easier. Um, and then, um, when I was still on active duty, they, they always place the rated individual first, which happened to be me in this case. And so we would try to find bases where there were plenty of maintenance opportunities for him. And so we did that three times. Uh, we had about almost eight years on active duty together. And then um, I decided to, we decided um, that I was separated and went to the reserve. So I was part-time and still am. And it makes it easier for me to move um, my job since he's, he's actually still on active duty. So I think that's the biggest thing. And, and that is every couple's, every family's, decision is how they want to prioritize that. For us, our priority was to be together as much as possible. And so that meant, you know, taking jobs that maybe either weren't the most interesting or maybe weren't the best career move, but allowed us, you know, to have another two or three years to live in the same house. Mm -hmm. So you were not on flying at the same time, like you would fly to Lebanon and he would fly to wherever for a mission. 
Yeah, so we, no, so we were lucky. We, right, uh, a couple months after we got married, we both moved to Utah and got to do, uh, got to do that. I was, um, that's where we were for 9-11. Mm-hmm. So uh, I flew lots of circles over major U.S. cities for months and months after that. And then we both got to go to Luke Air Force Base, which is, I, I went back to Arizona to be an instructor pilot. And then after that was when um, we decided to try to have kids. and so. Um, I put in to have a non-flying job because I didn't want to take, I, I knew I couldn't fly and I was pregnant, so I didn't want to take a job that would require me to fly when I physically was unable to. Mm-hmm. So, um, and that, that was probably a big turning point to take a job, deliberately get out of the cockpit and take a job that was flying related, but not actually airborne. Yeah. Do you feel like you're missing out? Um, I feel like... I never miss flying as much as I missed my kiddo when I had to go back for maternity leave. So for me, it was very instinctive and, and it was not even a question. It was, it was easy in the, in the grand scheme of things, it was easy to give it up. Um, and also because it's definitely a very unforgiving career field and, I didn't feel like I, at that point, personally, I didn't feel like I could put as much into it as requires to be proficient. And it's, it's very unforgiving, um, to, to fly that airplane. So no, I think that if anything, um, I feel like I kind of the best of both worlds. I still work in a tactical staff job where I get to interact and, and spend as much time with flyers as I do, um, without, having to commit to the time I would need to do that. And I wouldn't trade this time I have with my kids for anything, but I also think that, um, you know, I, I realize, you know, my kids have never seen me fly, you know, they've never seen me climb in or out of a cockpit. So that part of it, you know, I, I wish that they could have, um, and I wish they could understand that, but it just ended up being one of those things where it was kind of before their, before their time. Even now I commute from my home back out to Las Vegas for my reserve job. So, you know, they go months without seeing me in uniform because I just, I put it on when I'm at work and I take it off when I'm home. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is this the the girls, the reason why you left the air force? Um, yes, but I would never, uh, Becca was a baby. Uh, what is the reason I, I left active duty? And I wouldn't say, I would never say to her, like, you're the reason I left because it really, was more about me than it was about her. Um, I think she would have been just fine um, if I had stayed on active duty, probably. But um, it was something I needed to do, and I I'm super glad I did. I will say that um, I've been a reservist now longer than I've been on active duty, and my husband totally says I've come over to the dark side, and I am constantly recruiting from active duty. But I think it's a really unique thing that you can say to, to any any company that, Hey, we're, I really like this job, but I, I can't commit to doing it full time anymore. And so I like to do it part time and they say, okay. And so when I'm at home, I'm Kate. And when I go to work, I put my flight suit on and I'm Jigga. And I mean, I, I have a staff job, but I mean, there are plenty of people um, in the garden reserve who fly part time um, for the air force and then have other jobs or interests or family time outside of that. And so I've really come to appreciate the flexibility. And while it can be very complicated as I am, you know, swearing at the computer, trying to file my paperwork to get paid for part-time orders and travel reimbursement, whatever, um, in the grand scheme of things, it's really cool to have an organization that lets you do what you really love um, and do it part-time. Yeah, that's true. I mean, that's like when many women have kids and most women decide that they're going to give up their career and their jobs completely and become the mom, which is everybody has different choices. Um, But it's, I think it's really awesome that you were able to create this dual environment and that's fulfilling to you in both as roles as a mother, but also as a professional woman. Yeah, it's been really, it's been really great. I always thought I'd want to do like work, you know, one or two days a week and be with the kids, but it actually has become the norm at our house where I'm home for three months and then I'm gone for two or three weeks. And it is, it's a very, there's a, there's a line in the sand and this delineation of when I'm home and when I'm not home. And 
my kids have come to appreciate it. I think it's great time for um, my kids and my husband to figure out how to, you know, work together without me. I think it's great mom appreciation time for the kids. It's great wife appreciation time for him. Um, it's great time for me to, the other, the other thing too is in mean, the air force certainly gets their money is worth out of me because when I go to work, I don't have to go home and do laundry and tuck people in. Like I, I find myself staying later and later because I'm, I'm the reservist and everybody else there is going home to their family. So I'm happy to stay there and work longer hours because that's all I'm doing while I'm there. So I think it actually works out well for everyone involved. And that compartmentalization has really found its way into our life that way. And I also recognize that um, I am very fortunate that, you know, I graduated from college when I was 22. I went right to pilot training and I did all those things that I wanted to do, you know, by the time I was 30. And so everything I do, not that there aren't tons of things I want to do, but I, I don't look back on any part of my life with regret because I, I did all that stuff that I said I was going to do when I was 18. And so now it's just, it's really interesting to watch how the rest of it kind of unfolds as, you know, I prioritize or we prioritize as a family what's important to us. Yeah. That's a good way to look at it. Yeah. Um, no regrets. That's what I'm all about too. It's like, do what you want to do. Cause uh, sometimes women tend to have a hard time letting go and saying, Oh, my husband can't do this. He can't, they, they can't figure this out. He can't change diapers as an <laughs> example, uh, or that they're not getting healthy meals and sure can. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. I completely agree. I, I think there's definitely a part of, and whether it's cultural or generational or whatever, that we can be a little enabling. And someone said to me, uh, when my kids were very little, you know, they'll be as adaptable as we expect them to be. And so I have, you know, tried to apply that within reason over the years. And it's, it's true. They will step up to the plate when you need them to. And so will your husband. I mean, I, I definitely, that is one of my pet peeves when, you know, especially when the kids were little and someone would say, oh, I, I can't come to book club tonight because my husband can't put our three kids to bed. And I was like, well, no, see, that's not his fault. That's your fault. And I, I, like, I really, <laughs> that's probably going to come across pretty snarky to some people, but I, I think that, you know, um, I, well, even before I had kids and, and I would be at work and the guys would be like, oh, I got to go babysit my kids because you guys have a wife's coffee. And I was like, no, when I watch your children, it's babysitting. When you are with your children, it's called parenting. So I, I think that, um, you know, Greg has always been phenomenal with the kids. And I think that's, it's important, you know, for their relationship that they get to spend time without me because, you know, I'm, I'm allowed and I'm controlling. And so it's probably a nice break for me too. But um, yeah, I think that they will be, they will be as adaptable as we expect them to be. And um, he is certainly, they have certainly proved that so far. Now, Jigo, one of your messages is being proactive. Tell yes. us more about it. What does it mean to you or, or what can it mean to my audience? Yes, absolutely. I think that one of the things you learn as a, as a brand new pilot is, you know, you can't just like pull over the side of the road and ask for directions, right? The, the plane keeps moving. And so I remember having this instructor saying, you need to put the jet where you want it to be. And so I've always thought that's such an interesting metaphor, right? Like you need to put your life where you need it to be or you, or you where you want it to be. And so I think that looks different for every single person. And it's not just about, you know, you choose your own, what your priorities are. That's not, you know, for, for me to say, but I think that you can absolutely um, be proactive and pick what you want to, you know, what you want to do and then make your mission fit that. Yeah. Yeah. What else besides enthusiasm do we need in life? Uh, you know what? Um, so I was a cheerleader in high school, which is always surprising to people. Um, but uh, I think enthusiasm is so important. I mean, I gave my high school graduation speech about enthusiasm. But I think you also need a lot of direction. Um, so when we're flying, and this back to the ode to the top gun thing, you know, when they the planes kind of they go flying by each other and, you know, they're like, where'd he go? And like, where'd who go? Um, and that does happen. We do ACM fights and it's a 2v1 and you've got to keep track of who is, 
who is where, and, and if you just go zipping through the middle of a fight, we used to joke and call that a high speed cheerleader that like you basically just like flew right through that and you're like, yeah, good job. And you just kept on going and you didn't, didn't do anything useful. And so I think that enthusiasm is critical and essential, but you have to have some direction um, and, and focus it in a, in a positive way to just stand on the sidelines and, and cheer um, is maybe not necessarily um, the most helpful. <laughs> yeah, oh, I hear you. Why are sports and flying so similar? And what lessons can we learn from them? Yeah, I definitely think that I, I grew up in a sports household. My dad is a football coach. And, um, you know, the camaraderie is the biggest thing. You know, they talk about um, the huddle. Uh, you talk about um, being in a debrief, being in a four ship of, of fighter aircraft. Um, and there, there's that unique bond of being in that together. Um, and I would even throw it out as, as kind of what everything is going on right now. You know, there, when I'm talking about they do, there's no rank in a debrief and, and that kind of thing. And I've heard the same thing set out a huddle, right? There's no race, there's no religion, there's no ethnicity. Um, and, you know, even in flying, there's, there's no gender. And so sports and the military in general, specifically flying, you, you are like your capability and what you bring to the team, whether that's flying or, or athletically. And so that's such a great place to be where pretty much everybody is, is equal. Um, and it's, it's what do you, what do you bring to the fight? And, you know, I certainly, um, you know, have watched my dad is kind of more of the whole, like, uh, beg for forgiveness instead of ask for permission kind of thing. And to like watch him weasel his way into, um, football stadiums and practices and stuff and because he he just he acts like he's supposed to be there and he acts like he's supposed to like he belongs there as a fellow football coach and so you know I think that I adopted that when walking in as the first female fighter pilot in my squadron and of just not acting special or entitled or better but acting like I'm I'm just like any other lieutenant that came here and I belong here and I'm supposed to be here and so um, I certainly love to draw the parallels between sports and flying or sports in the military, but um, the, there's just so many lessons that you can take from one to the other. And also you find lots of people, you know, who end up as flyers, who end up in the military, participated in team sports, a huge advocate for team sports. And so um, there's just a lot of tr that translates there as far as hard work and equality and, um, you know, those lessons translate to pretty much everything. Yeah. What are three strategies you could recommend to women to manage their priorities? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so fighter pilots have a lot of techniques, a lot of procedures. Um, you know, one of them that I always uh, go to is my low altitude uh, checklist, basically your near rocks, your far rocks, lead, check six. So your near rocks, what's the most important thing? And, you know, when you're flying, it's, hey, don't hit the ground. Um, your far rocks and then don't hit the ground. That's beyond that. Your lead, you know, make sure you have mutual support. There's someone there. Uh, and then check six, you know, as the enemy rolled in behind us. And so what I would say is that's such a useful checklist. And But you can make those four components anything that you need them to be. So for now, maybe it's your near rocks is that everybody's healthy, right? And your far rocks is, you know, everybody in your household is surviving. And lead or your wingman, you're checking in with your spouse and, and your faith. And then, you know, maybe, maybe you can check six and, you know, see what's coming up next week. and maybe try to peek ahead to uh, things that are coming up. So that's one of my favorite um, fighter pilot techniques that I find myself, like I can hear myself saying, near rocks, far rocks, lead, check six. Um, all, I, it is, it's, it's like, and I joke about that, but you know, that brainwashing is for real in the Air Force, but once you train yourself to think a certain way, it will always be a part of you, and so you might as well use that to your advantage, right? So. You know, my husband jokes that if you want your household run efficiently, you should hire an old crusty fighter pilot, and he has me. So, but you just, <laughs> once, once you think a certain way and, and, and checklists and things like that become a part of your mentality, you can apply it. And I, I would also throw that out too, right? I use fighter pilot techniques in my everyday life, and I think that, you know, women can use that in anything. If, if you have something that's, that works for you, that's successful in one area of your life, there's nothing to say that you can't translate, translate that into, into other um, parts of your life. And I, I think that that goes for anything. But at the core of it, 
you know, to have strategies that you like and, and techniques that you use, and if mine's, just, you know, a, a little repetitive checklist or whatever it is, the, the ultimately, though, the things that you choose to feed into that strategy, the things that you choose to feed into that checklist, the, those have to be chosen by you and only you can make those decisions. And, and so you have to choose and prioritize. And once you pick and decide what's most important to you, then you can work that into, into any strategy or any technique or any, any checklist that you want. Yeah, I like that. That's very true. doesn't matter what you call it, but there's your list and there's your priorities. Right. Absolutely. I have a few more quick fire questions. Are you ready? Yes. All right. What values are most important to you? Um, that's great. Um, I would say loyalty and enthusiasm and hard work. Nice. What, uh, what is one of your best habits? Oh, one of my best habits. Um, well, actually, I've come into it a little later in life, I feel like, but um, working out has, has really become a lifeline. And, um, you know, I remember my dad put on his old running shoes in the 80s and go run in the middle of the day, and I thought he was a crazy person. And now I totally, I totally get it. So I need to work out pretty much every day to feel good. What is one of your strengths? Mm. Uh, you know what? I am going to, I'm going to stick with the uh, compartmentalizing. That is definitely, <laughs> uh, even if it's just, you know, I'm, I'm working from home like a lot of people are right now. And so to just say, I'm going to get up early and I'm going to dedicate these however many hours to this part of my work. And then when I, sh when I close the laptop, I close the laptop and, and move on to the next thing. And so, um, I think especially anybody that works from home, it's hard to do that, right. To, to stop something that's going on in your personal life and start work and vice versa. So, um, you know, compartmentalizing is, is def And you throw in there, I've always said this, that, you know, women are fantastic multitaskers. So you take compartmentalizing from flying and the female part of being, uh, really good at multitasking. And I think that's an awesome combination. What is the scariest thing you did? Mm, scariest thing I did. Actually, the scariest thing that I did, uh, because I did not fly in combat, the scariest, well, two things. One, after 9-11, putting real live missiles on my airplane and flying over, you know, Salt Lake City and San Francisco and Washington, D.C. with real weapons um, over our homeland was terrifying because I always envisioned I would carry those weapons over somebody else's country. Um, but as far as like the adrenaline rushing, like, oh my, um, when the students learn how to fly low altitude, and I said, it's so awesome to fly at low altitude. It is terrifying when you're in the back because we have two seat aircraft for the training. They're in the front and you're in the back. We do have controls in case it gets really, really dicey. Um, but any any good fighter pilot hates to give up control. But especially when they would strafe, when they would low angle strafe, you can get down to about 75 feet in the recovery. And because it's a low angle, you, that ground rush that's coming up at you, you're like, they're going to fly me right into the ground. So um, that was probably when I had my hands, the death grip, like ready to go to grab the, the stick and pull back at a moment's notice um, when they were lear learning to fly, to fly a low altitude. What does it mean to you to stay healthy? I think that staying healthy is being well balanced as far as, you know, I'm a big believer in everything in moderation, including moderation. So <laughs> I, you know, I, I had my granola and my yoga for breakfast and I had a sensible lunch and I will probably have a big entree salad with my husband tonight and a couple glasses of wine because that's what I've been saving my calories for. Um, but I think um, it's, it's your nutrition as well as um, a healthy workout. And I, I think a lot of that is, is what works for you. So choosing something that you like to do, um, I'm all for that. If you, if you hate working out, then you need to choose a different workout plan. Um, and then, you know, I also think um, just having I'm, – I'm a constant – not by nature, constantly in motion, constantly thinking of the next thing to do. 
um, just that built in fighter, fighter pilot mentality, go, go, go. And so to, you know, do something like yoga that makes me slow down to, you know, sit down and, um, say a prayer and, you know, you know, God said, you know, be still and know that I am, I am there. That, that is hard for me. And so I think that's kind of like the third, the third piece for me. Um, and ultimately probably at the foundation of all that is just, um, being grounded and being with the people that you love, I think kind of brings together, at least for me, all of that well-being. Yeah. What do you hope to achieve by sharing your story? Gosh, you know, um, I'd like to bring a little bit of levity and a little bit of, um, you know, fun. I, I feel like a lot of the, you know, the flying can be so serious. Um, the, the work ethic can be so hard and I just don't want any of it to be too precious, right? Like I, I want to make sure that it's still fun, that even while we're being respectful of everybody, it can still, we can still have a good time. It still be funny. Um, and I really think that I want people to know that they, um, can choose their own path and they can, they can choose to change that path and they can choose to set that path and that there are always people out there, you know, willing to help them along the way. And they might find inspiration in the most, you know, random of places just from some, you know, crusty old chick fighter pilot who has some funny stories to tell. Um, <laughs> so yeah. Cool. Awesome. Final question. Where can people reach you and learn more about you? Absolutely. So primarily, um, I work with a group called Athena's Voice, and you can find us at Athena's Voice USA, um, both on our website and on Facebook. We've got awesome women who are running that. We're a group of female fighter pilots who um, give inspirational talks and conferences and seminars. And so that's probably the best place to reach me as I am horrible, horrible with social media. But um, we're really hoping to reach out to people and spread a positive message and about flying, about inclusion, about equality, and um, you know, about being really proactive about what it is that is your life mission as you define it. Yeah. And you can hire Jiga, of course, as a speaker <laughs> at your next event, and you can find that information on Athena's uh, page. So thank you so much for sharing your story, Jiga, and all these cool information and the strategies that you shared with my audience. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me, Heike. It was great. So everybody else listening, reach out to Jiga and let me know on the Pursue Your Spark podcast or at Heike Yates on Instagram, Facebook, and all other social media. Reach out. Let us know what you thought of this episode. If you wanted to be a fighter pilot or any other questions that you have, we'd love to hear from you. So thank you. Thank you, Heike. It was great. Thank you. Bye, Jiga. Bye. Take care.